And now for our weekly news segment. Welcome hey guys. back, Cody. Hey. All right. Okay. Uh, let me share my screen. Go ahead, Tony. Yeah, try to uh, you know try to run through things today, just because uh, we want to get to viewers on stage, and we're already yes. well over three hours in here. Yes. So I think I'm going to skip over uh, the ones about transactions and um, all this stuff. No, yeah, think... uh, this untraceable one is is good just to kind of remind us of where we're currently at, right? So we hit almost 140k transactions. Uh, in looks one like. day, which is crazy. Uh, in one day, it was kind of the the peak of of all this. It's crazy how we just went up just like that. Yeah. Right, in a short all amount of all time. while fees staying super low, if anything, uh, getting lower. Yes. All right. um, then people. Um, they're discussing about who's profiting from from spamming the transactions, and then Mano has uh, an interesting view. Uh, the answer is simple: they need a Monero that isn't functioning properly. CBDCs are coming fast, and they don't want an exit route open for humanity. Trust must be destroyed in Monero. <laughs> Good luck with that. Um, long transactions waiting lines are just a part of the full scale attack on Monero by banksters. The attack is extremely well coordinated. He said we need to see them as one massive attack. The Monero delisting is the denial by crypto tracking sites, the complete silence of about Monero in the media, price manipulation, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Monero is in the middle of a war. Uh, which honestly, it's really good that Monero is being attacked from all angles because if Monero resists and persists through all this, which it which it does, and it thrives really well and it actually becomes even better, that just shows how potent it is. Um like for example, 16, 16 ring signatures. Okay, we're gonna have service. 128, I think it's gonna be. Uh, and even more upgrades, and it's gonna be, just gonna become better and better and better. F full full yeah. membership proofs, right? Uh, membership. We, we, we we spoke to, to Luke a week or so ago, and he, he thinks full membership proofs might be able to get implemented with the Seraphis upgrade, which would be amazing. <laughs> just another the question there. Did you ask him how big the transactions would be? Uh, yeah, I forget off offhand, but uh, they're, they're certainly going to be larger. I know. This is my question for Luke. Because that's the only number I need a number, so I can know what to work on for the scaling side of it. That's just my comment on the subject. Awesome. Yeah, well, uh, Luke, if you're listening, jump on up, please, for viewers <laughs> on stage. We'd love to get you chatting with Arctic live here. Go ahead, Tony. Keep going. Yes, I do want to say Arctic. Um, I'm still reading over your presentation from the first Monerotopia. <laughs> it's just your work is so amazing, and I still go over it. Thank you. It's, yeah. Uh, there's some people they say this would this could be a massive uh, dark market dark market uh, operation. Like a, a shutdown of the dark market is one of the theories that's been presented. I yes. Understand. Similar mm -hmm. to what happened with the pool that uh, shut down. That would be the case if it was transitory. But again, I mean, I mean, I already just got anecdotal evidence that this could be a shift to um, to this, to uh, unchain decentralized transactions. Mm -hmm. That's that's the thing. But but again, the dark market uh, shutdown would be very similar to what happened with that pool uh, just before the hard fork, where where you get the same sort of result: the surge in transactions. The question is, that would be fine for a period of time. If it stops, that could be an explanation. But if it continues, then, and especially if you start getting the, the, the anecdotal information from instant wallet transfers and decentralized exchanges and so on, then we would see um, that is the shift. And it could be both, too. It could certainly be a combination. Um, yeah. Go ahead, Tony. Keep, okay. keep rolling. Okay. Um, I actually want to go back and just uh, wanted to let you guys know that Sarai's testnet is now live and has started to produce blocks. Um, so that's very exciting as well. Beautiful. Just in the nick of time, for people who don't know what Sarai is, Sarai Dex uh, is going to be a decentralized exchange. It's going to function kind of similar to ThorChain based <clears> on <throat> liquidity pools. 
Um, if things work out as intended, and I see no reason why they shouldn't, it could lead to uh, Monero having a uh, an easy way to go in and out with other cryptos in a decentralized manner, uh, in, a, in, a, in a very usable, user-friendly way, um, eventually integrated into Cake itself and others, I'm sure. Uh -huh. Uh, where it will feel like you're using a centralized exchange and effectively you'll be able to swap in and out of Bitcoin to Monero, uh, other cryptos, uh, other cryptos as well that will be connected to Monero through the Sarai Dex, all decentralized. Uh, so super exciting there. And it's not, it's not theoretical, guys. Um, it's, it's happening. It's been launched. The test net's been launched. And I don't know. Any day now, we'll 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 all be actually using Sarai. So extremely exciting news there. I'm so happy about this. It's, it's so it's so cool and so exciting. Um, Which is also Luke Parker, by the way, for people who are listening in. Yep, Luke Parker. Uh, then we can touch about this. I manually increase your transaction fee if you want the quick con confirmation from uh, Rockingham, which is going to speak to that on Aratopia. Um, so what he's basically saying is that you can set the fee in the Monero GUI to normal X1 fee instead of what it is usually automatic, which will be slow 0.2 X fee. Now, well, actually, gonna... if I may say that, that was the old numbers. I believe the the, the, the low one is, is X1 and then the next one is like X4. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because we scaled everything. And I think that's probably the reason why we got the bug. When we did the last hard fork, we went from 0.2 to 1 for the low fee. And then we added a second tier fee. And that might be what threw off the the earth. So we don't want to put the you don't want to go at the the lowest tier. You want to go the one above. But what used to be the normal is now the lowest. Hmm. So that that's I think where the confusion lies. Mm -hmm. So they were shifted. So what happened is we 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 used to have a a point two times fee. That's gone. One is the lowest fee. But now what we need to be doing is we need to scale it to the next level, which is the times four. Mm. And that's what wasn't happening. And that's what solves the problem. So you can't just go from to the times one. Well, we're at the times one. Well. And I think it's the mission also has displayed in the wallet. So that's what needs to be cleaned up. But effectively, the lowest fee right now what used to be the normal fee before the, the last half fork. Interesting. Okay. Because we, we raised it already. Uh, uh, and so the scaling, it, it, I think what may be happening in the bug is it thinks it's already at one, so it doesn't grow it anything. All right. Okay. So that's just the point that we had to watch. The, so when you look at your wallet, just go to one tier, uh, uh, not the X1, go to the next tier up. That's what you want to be using. And your transaction will go through it right away. So if you, don't, go, don't go to the automatic. Look at all the tiers that you have. The lowest one is the one that you're getting right now. You go one tier up, which I think is four times what we pay. What you pay right now? Okay, you well, that's just medium. So just switch to medium. I know I'm an Aragui. It's normal. And, and what what is what is that fee right now? It's like still like uh, it should be four cent. times. It it's should be four cent. times instead of uh, point two five cents. Amazing. Still wow. so, so it's still yes, yes. So that's the one you need to be using. You need to go above one, and I think it's uh, normal. This is where I'm, I'm trying to remember the terminologies that we use. Normal was the old, the low. I think it's the now the normal, and then the next level is medium, and then there's high and very high. There's four levels. We need to be on the second level from the bottom. I mean, it's just amazing when you think about it. We're doing what right now, like t twenty percent of Bitcoin's transactions, or ten percent. Something what are we like doing? that. Well, it's about no, it's closer to thirty percent. Wow, thirty percent, and right now it costs one cent. Uh, with, with that's with bumping up your fee, so you yeah so you yeah have, have be... a very seamless transaction, it basically instantly, uh, effectively confirms right as a block every two minutes. Yeah. But it conf... Paying a quarter of a cent, we should be paying one cent. Amazing. One cent 
to send a Monero transaction, yeah. we're doing 20% of Bitcoin's uh, yeah, network sure, yeah. transactions. But in the meantime, if you do want to spend high fees for some reason, like this person paid 16 fees for a lightning transaction, you can on Bitcoin. Um, yeah, the Which, transaction. that doesn't even make it. I don't, I don't even want to try to understand that. I mean, we talk about all the criticism of the lightning network. The, the one thing that you should be getting is super cheap fees all the time. Not uh, if you so, have to sink your money. Not if you have to sink the thing. Yeah, so that that's just just, just wild. Watching uh, kind of LN fail in real time. That medium block size is still pretty high. All the re most recent blocks have been, uh, with the exception section of one, have been 370 <clears throat> kilobytes, which earlier this week it was around 305, 315 kilobytes. So it's gone up a decent amount. So, so Bitcoin blocks are around 400 something. For 29, Monero is showing at about 180 or something like that. And this, sorry, 170. No, let me see if I can read this. 120. It's roughly about a third. Hmm. Intersection rates. Wow. That's incredible. The, the flipping might happen sooner than we think in terms of, in terms of transaction count. <laughs> well, that means it's very <laughs> bearish. You know? But the, the transaction count in Bitcoin is, is limited. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Exactly. All right, Tony, keep, um, moving, keep moving. Somebody wrote in the comment section, uh, Arctic Mine, I think many people have the wrong idea about fee adjustments. May I request clarification that no fee adjustment has occurred? My understanding is that minimum fees only decrease when the long-term median increases, meaning they have not lowered. It will not be lowering for the next 70 days, no matter what happens. Um, it's on uh, YouTube. That's correct. The uh, in order to lower the adjustment of the fee, you have to move the long term medium, and that's a thousand, a uh, hundred thousand uh, uh, blocks, which is approximately somewhere about seventy days, so eighty days from now, somewhere in that range. Yeah, that's correct. That's a, that totally correct statement. Right, so we, we haven't, we haven't even seen the lower fees kick in yet. Yeah, but what's going to happen there? I mean, yeah. we're, we're like 20% above, so we're going to drop it down by maybe, you know, 30% or something, or 40%. Amazing. Wow. So we're not going to drop it down drastically. Sorry, yeah, it's, it's in that kind of range. So we're going to have a small drop, but we're not going to have a huge drop. And all that does is it restricts the growth of the block size. Uh, at the bottom, at the lower fee. So again, I go back. We have to go one fee up. But again, what can happen if it stabilizes around some level like that? Then you don't. Then you go back to the low fee. It's just a slightly uh, larger block size. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I, again, once that long term medium triggers, which is going to be, then you can see a small reduction in fees. But then we have to see what's happening. Is it still growing? Or is it just sort of flattening out or maybe dropping a bit? And if it's stabilized, then then you don't need the 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 the, the higher fee because it's the rate of growth that matters here. That determines not the block size. So the rate of growth is what you pay the penalty on. It's just right. um, when it comes to Monero, um, yeah, the privacy is amazing. But it, the moment we discuss fees and dynamic block size and everything, it's just just as interesting and amazing. Uh, but let's move on. Let's uh, this. It's gonna get really interesting now. So, um, kind of stepping away from transactions, and now we're gonna talk about more international stuff. So let's discuss the EU Parliament officially approving the European Digital Identity uh, Wallet. So. They said it's going to be voluntary, but just like they said with the digital vaccine passports, that they would be voluntary. They essentially want to force a Chinese social credit style digital surveillance state uh, once. So they're saying that it's voluntary, but then they have target goals of how many people would use it. And they want 80% of, of the population of Europeans to use it by 2030 for almost all areas, areas of life. Travel, social media, and other online logins, doctor's appointments, public transport, you'll need your digital wallet for basically everything. What could possibly go wrong from there? Um, so let's watch this video. It's uh, 48 seconds. The digital identity mm -hmm. is not just a passport that you will have on an, on your iPhone mm -hmm. in a digital form. It entails 
just about everything the government would like to know about you. Mm. The best way to get to a modern person's heart is mm. to say that it's convenient for them. Mm. So yes, you won't have to carry all your different papers and your passports. But the downside of it is, and I hope that people will start to see this, that the government can shut you down. Yeah. So you, you know, if you want to buy a burger, yeah. red screen, no mark, not for you. That flight, <laughs> not for you. Oh, but you can just buy it if you have enough money, right? So yeah. they're being very open and honest to what their goal is here. Yeah. So we should take their words seriously and say, hell no. I would say we should cancel these communists immediately and say, get the hell out of my private life. I'm not having you track me and decide what I eat and where I go. The digital. She, uh, she is a, a Monero woman for sure. I don't know if she, she's quite, quite realized it yet. <laughs> we'll, we'll, waiting for her to discover Monero. She has a tremendous following. Oh, she, she does. It would be awesome if we got her on the show. Uh, mm -hmm. That would be awesome. But yeah, it's just interesting how they're, they're saying that, uh, yeah, this is going to be voluntary. And then we want 80% of the population by 2030. Um, <laughs> and at that point, they're going to control. And you can watch the WF uh, talks and then you can, you can see what they're planning. Uh, they want to control how much uh, meat you're eating and all this stuff. Uh, traveling. How much are you traveling? Because carbon emission and all this stuff, but they're using their private jets. So that's cool. Um, okay, so let's move on. This this piece of news is actually really big and I encourage everybody to, to read it. So it's about Argentina. Argentina has been with the, uh, where is it? FATF, which is a financial action task force for, for decades. And what they, are, what they essentially do is that they enforce anti-money laundering uh, regulations on the countries. Uh, March 6th, which I think today is the 9th, yeah, so three days ago, uh, they arrived in Argentina and they're going to conduct a two-week assessment on whether Argentina is going to be blacklisted or it's, if it's still going to be on the grade list. So what is the grade list? Essentially, Argentina is right now on the grade list, meaning that it serves as, as a warning for the countries to be compliant in the direction and which if they're found that they're not, then they're going to end up being blacklisted. And Argentina is very uh, cash uh, dominant. Cash is being, is being used strongly, and uh, you can do all sorts of, um, of uh, stuff, you know, in contracts. You can pay more in cash, less digitally, and all this stuff. So what is going to happen with Argentina in the next two weeks? Um, how, how is Millet going to respond? It's going to be very, very interesting. Yeah, uh, basically, uh, we spoke about this last week, Financial Action Task Force putting pressure on Millet and the Argentinian government to essentially clean, clean up their... their they're black markets, they're gray markets. Um, and uh, so one of the things that Malay is doing is passing an executive order, uh, which, uh, you know, could lead to will lead to more uh, regulation on crypto, essentially creating kind of like a bit license for people for companies that are crypto based in Argentina, forcing the the uh, the regulation uh, of, of crypto. So people so these companies will have to obtain a essentially a bit license to operate. Um, one of the other things that was being discussed is uh, f f uh, creating regulations where citizens of Argentina are forced to declare their crypto holdings. Uh, so interesting to watch this. We're as anybody who's watching this knows, we're doing Monerotopia down in Argentina. We're very excited about Argentina and Malay as being a place where uh, crypto is naturally blossoming or has already naturally blossomed because of the situation out there down, down there with regards to uh, fiat failing and people uh, using other means um, and finding themselves using crypto. Um, there's a there's a whole. We, we, Tie, the, the, the society basically already has opted out in Argentina. People are used to functioning through black markets, uh, using cash for everything, uh, and moving, moving out of their cash anonymously into things like cryptocurrency because of uh, how, how quickly their local currency loses value. So actually, mm -hmm. most of anything, they're using the US dollar down there. Uh, but what, what makes what has made Argentina this kind of petri dish for for crypto to naturally blossom is the fact that fiat is 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 hurting the the local population so badly that they've moved over to alternative means. So it will be interesting to see 
what happens there, how these things transpire. Um, but hopefully we don't ironically end up in a situation where uh, Argentina becomes uh, less of the ideal crypto place um, because because of the uh, you know the, the ushering in of these regulations through the Financial Action Task Force. Yeah, Arctic, I, I don't know if you, I don't know if you're following these things. Or if you I have am following some yep. of this. Yep. Yeah, I have an interesting comment. It's a bit of an interesting one. I there was uh, during COVID there was an article in uh, CBC News, which is the government. Um, sponsored uh, radio state uh, television and radio and website and what they did is they went to six supermarkets and they tested a whole bunch of surfaces for COVID-19 hmm. card handles door handles a whole bunch of different things and the price went and you're gonna love this the ship and pin machine it was the dirtiest surface in all these six supermarkets for COVID-19 a whole bunch of other viruses. And when you think about it, credit card, card transactions are not contactless. That's a big myth, uh, especially in restaurants, because you have to touch the machine to enter your step and you enter the amount and stuff like that. A lot of places, you have to touch the machine in order to do a credit card transaction. Well, here's where it gets interesting. If you look at how many times a machine in, say, a busy store or like a coffee shop, those buttons are touched by different people in a day, and you compare with the touch frequency of cash, it turns out that cash wins on a COVID basis. Hmm. So a very simple strategy is when presented with the debit machine, refuse to touch it because of COVID and pay cash instead. It shocks people. I mean, I can, I, I, I've done this, and it's really quite fascinating. Uh, you simply say, they give you the debit machine. I'm not touching that because of COVID, and you, give, and you pay cash. And then the rationale is very straightforward, is that the amount of time a $20 bill gets touched in a day or a $5 bill gets it's way less than the amount of time those buttons on the ship and pin machine get touched every day. Mm -hmm. So... That's kind of my thing about this. I think we need to start moving a lot more towards cash for small transactions. Not the big stuff. Let them track that. But it's the coffee shop and uh, and the small transactions where they're real advanced. Same thing with the European thing. I mean, what happens if you start paying cash? And in fact, I remember at um, Moneracon in Lisbon, the, all the, not the, the previous one, I convinced everybody to go out of a, of a restaurant because they wouldn't take cash. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I mean, they wouldn't take uh, cash money. Walk up. But so, Arctic, what, what, what do you think about Argentina uh, and Malay? Do you think uh, that the use of cash has kind of, uh, essentially peaked, and uh, and ironically, Malay may may move the society less towards being less uh, cash based? Well, that's what they're trying to do. I mean, this is what they tried to do in the European Union. In some countries, it's been successful, and some it hasn't. But I mean, Malay, Europe, Malay is supposed to be a, an anarcho-capitalist, right? I mean, he should be pro pro cash, right? Well, we, we don't know whether he's going to do it or not. Uh, but the message that we can send people is say, well, don't touch the machine because of COVID. It's, it's just one of those that, that people haven't thought of because there was this big push during COVID. Oh, no, no, go to digital tag. I said, safe or not, it's not. And, and it's a simple thing you can do. Just refuse to pay with debit cards and credit cards for small transactions. Uh, and set the threshold at you know $100, 100 euros. Uh, you can raise it if, if it's a particularly restrictive country like that they have a cap of whatever the cap is. Fine, you, you can't use it over 1,000 euros. Fine, anything under 1,000 euros, I'm paying cash. You're compliant, and you totally defeat the surveillance. And yeah, if I enough mean, people, yeah, it's a simple way around it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, and right then, now, my understanding is you could go into Argentina and you you could buy most property now is purchased with cash with actually U, U.S. U.S. dollars cash. Yeah, well, that's, that's most that's, properties currently purchased in Argentina, which is crazy. But I mean, when you're beautiful. talking about tracking people with money, it's not the big transaction. If you buy a house, the government's going to know 
that you all bought that house, which is registered on the land title of the of registry, of, et cetera. Of course. It's yeah, but, 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 the, but the idea that they're currently not asking you, where did that money come from? They don't have strong anti-money laundering laws down there. You could That's... go, you could buy. A, in fact, most, most real estate deals are done with cash. And, the, and when you do it, you're not asked, hey, prove, prove to us that that money is not dirty. Uh, which yeah, I know that, is, is really an ideal, right? Uh, it's the same with Monero right now. You could essentially go down there, go to one of these Cuevas, trade your Monero for cash, and go buy real estate with cash. Uh, no okay. questions asked. That um, that kind of thing I see happening at Cracktown. Uh, the, the, I can see that happening. But whether it gets more, uh, the real harm is actually not in the big transaction. Is in the small trends. I'm far more concerned about the cup of coffee than I am about the house. Because the cup of coffee is where you actually are surveilling the population. Mm -hmm. So it's where you say to people, you go to a restaurant, we only take electronic payments, I walk up. And I've done that. And or I've enforced the currency laws. I've done that too. And I'm far more, I don't have a problem paying for a $2,000 item with a credit card. I have a problem paying for a cup of coffee with a credit card. Mm -hmm. And that's where and that's where the fight needs to be because that, that's why you're controlling the population. You're not controlling it by tracking the one time you buy a house. Yeah, well, but it, it uh, you know, freedom to transact, right? It would be beautiful to, to live in a world, uh, in a country where you can... Uh, you know, pay with your Monero, no questions asked, whether you're buying a coffee, a car, a piece of real estate. Uh, that's kind of, that's kind of yeah. in my mind, that's the uh, anarcho-capitalist libertarian dream. Absolutely. But I mean, but the fact of the matter is, it's a lot easier to fight the fight with the small stuff than the big stuff. Which I also want to add, when it comes to small transactions, they are able to profile you as an individual because your small transactions that you do every single day kind of make up who you are. Exactly. Uh, so that's very important for sure. That's very by, by the way, the uh, the guy who wrote this article, Bowtie Maria, w was on the show a couple of months ago, right after the Malay election. He really follows Malay very closely, and he's he's lives down there, but uh, communicates very well in English. We will most likely have him as a speaker at Monerotopia, by the way. And my theory about not using cash versus credit cards. I go further. If you have U.S. currency, COVID-19 lifts shorter on U.S. currency than on Canadian currency. Canadian currency is made out of plastic. Uh, U.S. currency is made out of fiber paper. So it dries out the virus faster. So there's a scientific basis behind this, and it works even better in the United States than in Canada, even though the origin of the idea is in Canada. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So just refuse to pay, make small transactions with, with uh, credit cards. Which is so interesting because now they're at war on on, on cash, but it just shows that they do, they don't care about the scientific data and about. Well, you know, it, it was a sales pitch because exactly. they tried to push, and until and it this came out, they pushed it. This is why, I, you know, someone tries to sell me something that I don't buy, that I used to rebel against it, and in this particular example, a lot of people jumped on the bandwagon and started buying cash all over the place. And then everybody's backtracked. A lot of people are backtracked. And in fact, New York, I understand, is a city where you have to pay cash. You have a business, you have to accept cash. Maybe Doug can correct me on this. So there are some places that are coming to the sanity on this issue because it's discriminatory. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And in the European Union, there are countries like Spain, I think it's a thousand euros, and Germany is like 10,000. There's some countries that are very supportive of cash, uh, Germany uh, being one of them, and the others are not. To depend on where in the European Union you go, you get a different response on this. Mm. Also, but Romania, again, positive sorry? as well. Uh, I Romania. know that in, it, in, in Italy, there's been a big backlash over this issue of uh, credit card fees. And the other problem you get into is that you get charged, you know, sure, the European Union restricted the fees for domestic transactions, but not for international transactions. When I go to the EU, I take cash in euros. And I pay most of my stuff in cash. Give me a seltzer with lemon. All right, Tony, moving on, moving on. Let's keep going. Yeah. So we get viewers on stage over here. 
Yes, I do want, I do want to mention it's uh, we have a really good like to uh, uh, views ratio on YouTube, 74 to 67, and it's we still have 74 people. So that's amazing. Thank you, everybody. And uh, well, we have we have um, four. We have almost 500 live viewers if you include uh, Twitter. Beautiful. Right, right now. Yeah. Right now? Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. That's really good. That's yeah. really good. Uh, I want to say somebody said in the comments, my friend who lives in Europe said his country will release the digital passport on their app yesterday. It's, it's coming fast. Um, interesting. It is coming fast. Crazy. Um, don't trace me, bro. Untraceable. Uh, posted this picture. Gold at ATH for the first time in over a decade. You know what that means. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> it's, yeah. Arctic, just real quick, uh, this this uptick in gold. Do you think it might be indicative of something happening behind the scenes that there, we're going to see some big, large global event? I mean, I, I, I kind of an investor. I, I do hold some gold myself. Um, I haven't really followed it that closely, but I do buy gold. Uh, gold is interesting because, in some circumstances, if you want something, you can withdraw from the bank. I don't know how this sounds. Uh, it's a lot easier to buy gold if you want that to buy than to get cash, and it's a lot easier to move gold around than to move cash around. So we've gone full circle on this. If you look at the weight of an ounce of gold in a coin, how much cash it takes to buy that, and the weight of the cash, now it's getting to the point where the the cash, anything under a hundred dollar bill, the gold is more efficient by weight than the cash. But but do you do you see gold as a canary in the coal mine in terms of seeing like a large spike in, in interest in gold? Um, is it potentially indicative of something uh, well, a large it, event that might happen? It can be. I mean, on the small scale, I think people are starting to look at gold a lot, also because of a lot of the cash restrictions. There's got, there could be issues with. Um, I mean, there's been a lot of money printing after COVID. There are a lot of concerns about inflation and all that kind of stuff. We've seen uh, the aftermath of that. Uh, I mean, it's 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 something that I would suggest. That I, I hold some gold. I don't. I don't make any hide of it. Uh, it has a certain a certain uh, historical appeal, but also you're not going to make become a millionaire holding gold. But what you will do is you preserve value very effectively over a long period of time. That's what gold has proven itself. I come back to what I said. I mean, uh, U.S. senator. They spend the same amount of calls in terms of gold as the Roman senator did 2,000 years ago. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's a simple value. It's it's there. Um, it could it could move out again because there's a lot of inflation. There's a lot of debt in the world. There's a lot of risk in the world. I mean, the the stock market has been very very hot, uh, and it could get a hit. Look at the look at the bubble we're seeing with Bitcoin right now, which I think is totally unfounded. Um, there's a lot of hot money running around, so I can see why people are looking at gold. Okay. All right, Tony, keep keep moving along here. This one, really quick, Mano. Monero is at war, and this is how it looks like. And then he posted a picture of CoinGecko. Listing top privacy block blockchains by market cap. <laughs> Monero not making the list, but of course, Ironfish makes it. I've never even heard of it, to be honest. Um, Wait, what? What's this? Ironfish. Okay, so number one is Mina Protocol. Number two, o Osis Network. Three, Aleph Zero, Dust Network, Secret Network, and Ironfish. Now, and they're not putting and they're not putting Monero in the list. That's pretty odd. Yeah, no. So yeah, yeah, no. yeah. No, this is this happened like last week. Coin Gecko sent out a tweet: top blockchains by uh, privacy. Yeah, Monero wasn't mentioned. Zk, it, it was uh, whatever. But yeah, yeah uh, a... I th overall, uh, Amano is listing all the attacks attacks that he's seeing on Monero here, right? Like it, it's it's yeah. odd that Monero is being left out of the discussion for best privacy coins when it is the number one privacy coin. Uh, we saw the. Uh, He's referencing um, the ASIC miners that were supposedly being uh, created, but you know that hasn't proven to well, well right. Well, Essentially, those were just were just CPUs. At the end of the day, the Binance delisting, uh, which was a big event, um, as being another attack on Monero. Monero no longer delisted on centralized exchanges. Well, that's um, not true. Now, There's a lot of centralized exchanges that are still list Monero. 
Well, uh, but, but there's there's less than there were, right? And we, you've yeah, seen but this some is major... this is a topic that I really have to wait till after this litigation before I can comment on. Okay, <laughs> perfect. Uh, There's a reason then... I'm in Washington D.C. and it's got to do exactly with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect. So, uh, let's discuss KuCoin really fast. KuCoin halting transactions or XMR withdrawals are closed. Again, don't use these platforms, don't use centralized exchanges. And last thing that I want to discuss is all ARC introduces cash in person from another exchange in exchanges in the EU. That is for Berlin, Stuttgart, Dusseldorf, Frankfurt, Paris, Keynes, Rome, Milan, Barcelona, Madrid, Amsterdam. So essentially, he said, hi, everyone. Tommy reaching out from all ARC. Our journey since 2022 has been dedicated to offering a simplified solution for converting Bitcoin cash into trad traditional currency yeah, bank transfers, mail, cash, debit card methods. Uh, okay. Though it is focused, it is coming to Europe. So I can go to Madrid and actually get some euros for some more there? How does that um, work? Allegedly. Um, not really sure. He said our recent beta tests have been successful with positive feedback that we're excited to build on. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. This is the first time that I'm that I'm hearing about it. So, if anybody I... has any more info on this, jump up on stage. For sure, but that that'll be cool. I mean, I mean well, to Madrid and do Euro. Oh, yeah, I could just buy awesome. the euros in, in uh, Canada, and I've got enough cash. Canada, don't worry about it. But it's kind of nice to know. Mm -hmm. What what's uh what's currently the best way to obtain Monero in Canada? Okay, I am trading because I'm the I'm a sort of a very successful Monero holder, and also I go through a private uh, uh, OTC OTC uh, desk because mm -hmm. I do trade significant amounts. Uh, the, if you're dealing small amounts, I believe the best option is to go through Kraken. Now there isn't a direct CAD XMR pair, but you basically what you do is you deposit money into Kraken. And then you buy Bitcoin and then trade mm. the Bitcoin for Monero, or buy a, a stable coin and, and trade that for Monero. Wait, but you but you're saying you you can trade you you can't buy buy Monero right. directly on Kraken in Canada. Not from well, you can, but you have to deposit your Canadian dollars and find a pair for Canadian dollars and, and you do it all within Kraken. You don't have to go to a different exchange. Oh, okay, yeah, Kraken, yeah, that's yeah, that's what I'm saying. So so you deposit, you can, you are buying directly from Kraken. You deposit, you, you can into Kraken. And then what you would do is you would have to trade it for something else and then within Kraken, trade it for XMR. And then got it, got it, got it. That, that if you want to go through through a uh, centralized exchange. No, is is that the case on Kraken in the U.S. too? Because I've never in New York. We no, don't have access the, to Kraken. The, no, there's Kraken. There's this direct USD. Uh, okay, uh, I thought so. Uh, uh, XMR pass. I don't. But think in Canada, direct... Canada, there's not. That's interesting. That's you interesting. may have to buy Bitcoin and then flip the Bitcoin for. Uh, okay. Um, for for Monero and Kraken itself. Okay. That that's where you may have to do. Or you may be able to deposit USD directly because can it, uh, you can give very easy access to USD in, in Canada and deposit USD into Kraken and trade that for money. That's the other way to do it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, then, and then again, you really ask the question, what, what am I spread? Am I going to pay on CAD USD versus CAD PTC? That's essentially mm -hmm. the question you need to ask. Yeah, the, other, the other way to do it is you would buy... Bitcoin through one of the local exchanges and transfer it over the Bitcoin network into into Kraken and do it that way. I've done that. The thing to watch out for is you make sure that you don't commingle. You you you, you take the Bitcoin out of one exchange, withdraw it to one address that's never been used before, and then move it into the second exchange, mm -hmm. so they can trace it from one exchange to the other. Right. And then otherwise, you get into it. Yeah. Otherwise, it'd be flagged. And it really depends on the amount of the spreads versus the Bitcoin network fee. So you gotta figure out the amount of money that you have, which is the more efficient way to do. It. Mm -hmm. But if you're gonna move Bitcoin, the way I would suggest doing it is not get the exchanges to do it, but rather create a new Bitcoin address. It's never been used before. Withdraw out of the exchange into the Bitcoin address. Take of that Bitcoin address to the second exchange. Mm -hmm. 
And your KYC to both ends, so the, the, the tunnel is totally KYC. But that way, you avoid any kind of allegations. Right, right, right. That's what I'm getting at. So that's what we're going to do. All right, Tony, keep moving. Uh, that was it? Mm-hmm. So that was it for uh, this week. We don't have oh, the, uh, that was it. That was it. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. 